The third thing that Isaiah brings before us is his supremacy or preeminence above the creation. Look at verse 15 to 20 with me. To establish this truth of the preeminence of God above the creation, Isaiah first turns to the nations of the earth. Compared to God, he says, they are like a droplet of water dripping from a full bucket. Now you know how insignificant that is. As someone carries a bucket full of water, there is a drip that may appear from the bottom of the bucket and drop unnoticed to the earth. Now that is what the nations are like compared to God. And of course, Israel had become cowed and afraid of the overwhelming power of the nations around them. They had come to think of power in these terms, in human terms of human resources and human influence. And God says the nations are like a drop in a bucket, or they are regarded as dust on the scales. When you are thinking of what something weighs, the dust on the scales is insignificant. You might imagine that a Scotsman wouldn't be very prone to believe that, but <laughs> it's true nonetheless, and the comparison is so real. They are regarded as dust on the scales, he says. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. A comparison probably with all the islands of the earth or the Mediterranean coastlands. But the whole point is, you see, that Israel has tended to think of true greatness in terms of mighty nations and military powers. And here God humbles the nations and exalts his own name and glory so that in verse 17 before him all the nations are as nothing they are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing and the very last phrase at the end of verse 17 is the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 1, for the earth being without form and void. In comparison with God, therefore, they are nothing worthless, less than nothing. Now, having demonstrated how lightweight and lilliputian the nations are before God, in verse 16, he turns to tell us that nothing man can offer to God in worship would adequately exalt and honor him. Notice verse 16, Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. The vast cedar forests of Lebanon would not provide enough fuel the whole of its animal population would be insufficient sacrifice to praise his glory and express his honor. Now here is something that we experience, don't we, in some measure when we come to worship, in moments when we are brought into the presence of God and something of his infinite glory begins to dawn on our spirits, we recognize that we are totally incapable of offering to him the worship and the glory that belongs to him. No wonder Stephen Charnock says, it is in such an hour that the sensitive soul longs for heaven, because there we shall be free to worship and adore and honor him in the way that will truly magnify his name. John Calvin prays at the end of one of his expositions, and 
If you have never read John Calvin praying, you really ought to do that. Some of his expositions are worth the money for the prayers at the end of them alone. Sovereign Lord, he says, thy glory is beyond all praising. Thy majesty leaves us speechless. We can neither fathom thy greatness nor truly praise it. Therefore all that we may do is humble ourselves before thee and lie in thy presence crying, Be thou exalted above all. Now it is this infinite greatness of God which makes both images that represent God in verse 18 and idols which replace God in verses 19 and 20 so offensive to him. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? That, of course, is the root of the second commandment, that we shall not make to ourselves any graven image, because the glory and greatness of God is inevitably going to be blasphemed by an image of that kind. It is that that makes idols such an offense to God also. And in verses 19 and 20, Isaiah clarifies that for us, reaching at the end of verse 20, the moment of sarcasm where he says he looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. So God's greatness is revealed to us in his preeminence above all that he has created and formed. But fourthly, the prophet goes on to tell us from verses 21 to 24 that God's greatness is revealed in his sovereignty over the creation. Now here is something again that he wants to awaken the understanding of God's people to grasp. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. Now the prophet charges the people with having forgotten the central fact of all life, and that is that it is the living God who is on the throne of heaven and earth, and his greatness is exercised in his sovereign rule over everything that he has made. First, you notice, he is sovereign over the earth in verse 22. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and before him the peoples of the earth are like grasshoppers. But of course that is not how they thought of themselves, and God's people were being infected by the spirit of man-centeredness. They were impressed by great men and had come to the conclusion that the course of history was decided by princes and rulers of the earth. Well, now God sets their thinking straight in verses 23 and 24. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing because it is he and not they who sit on the throne of the universe and directs the affairs of men and nations and ultimately decides their destiny. Now that's something that we greatly need to learn afresh in our generation. It's true, of course, that every period of history has produced its proud dictators who intend to establish a kingdom for themselves. But do you notice how Isaiah pictures them? Verse 24, no sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, 
No sooner do they take root in the ground, he pictures them in horticultural terms, you see, to a plant that has been carefully placed in the ground and taken root and has begun to grow up and show itself. And then at their proudest moment, when they are displaying themselves to the eyes of men and enjoying their attention, when they rise up against the living God at his own time, he reaches down, as it were, from heaven, and he simply blows on them. And they are scattered. Now, that's a very vivid picture of the sovereign Lord in his majesty ruling over the nations of the earth, including his enemies. I stood a few weeks ago in Germany, in Munich, in one of these vast squares where Adolf Hitler once stood, speaking to a multitude that it was difficult to imagine in size, but you could almost sense the atmosphere for the place is still there, a great area of open ground. And one inevitably thought of how this man who once terrorized half the world and made the rest of the world tremble before him was blown aside by the living God. Do you remember Nikita Khrushchev? who spoke at the time when Russia was putting its first space capsule into orbit. He said, we are going to send two Russians into space. And we are going up into the outer atmosphere of space. And if we find God there, we will topple him from his throne. Some of you may not even have heard of Nikita Khrushchev. <laughs> it's interesting to ask whose throne toppled first, isn't it? But my dear friends, this is the kind of thing that the prophet Isaiah is forcing people to think about, and we need desperately to think about it today. Because our vision and view of God has been so restricted that we have begun to get this man-centered view of the world and of history. And I want to say to you this evening that the destiny of men and nations, the great decisions that are going to affect the destiny of the world in which we live are not taken in Washington or in Moscow or London or any other human capital. They are taken where the Lord God omnipotent sits on the throne with the government resting on his shoulders. And that's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his mercy has become our God and our Savior. We need our vision expanded to grasp that. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. But notice, he is not only sovereign over the earth, he is sovereign over the heavens. From verse 25, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Now he has bid them look to the earth, you see, and understand that these rulers and princes of the earth are under the sovereign hand of Almighty God. Now he says, look to the heavens. Who created all these 
He who brings out the starry host one by one. Now, the significance of lifting their eyes to the heavens for the Babylonians was this, that people who lived in a Babylonian culture would have been influenced by their astrology. They were primitive people, you see, who thought that their life was ruled by the stars. Have you ever come across any other primitive people like that? <laughs> I guess they opened their paper in the morning to consult their horoscope to see whether it was propitious to do something on a particular day, you know. Do you know in Britain today, in the telephone service, you can get all sorts of things. You get cricket line, which gives you the scores of the latest cricket match. And my telephone goes up hugely in the summer when my son's at home and he wants to get the latest cricket results. Cricket line gives you that. You can get pop line, which gives you the latest music on the pop charts. You can get storyline, which gives you a story any time of the day that you like to dial. Do you know the latest thing you can get? Starline, which tells you what the latest horoscope is for the day. And I was intrigued to discover the London Times reporting a few weeks ago that it is the line with the heaviest use of all. Well, these people amongst whom God's people had lived, they were people who believed that the starry host somehow controlled their destiny. But now Isaiah speaks the words that God has given him and says, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one. Now, the language is military. And what he is speaking about is God, like a great general, marching out the stars one by one. And he calls them each by name. Now, we know that the stars are beyond numbering. Do you notice what God's greatness is like? He is the God who summons the stars to come and follow him in a ray as he leads them out one by one, and he calls them each one, every single one of them by name, and we know that there are as many as there are grains of sand on the seashore. But he has got them all named. His greatness, you see, extends to this that he not only knows the stars by name, but he has the hairs of the head of his children all numbered. And not one of them, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Now there is God's greatness related to his keeping power over the stars of the universe, when he calls them by name to appear, not one of them will be missing. And the eternal God is able thus to call out his people one by one and to know them by name. And in the end of the day, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them will be missing. Behold, your God, says Isaiah. Now that leads us right into the application. If he can do that for the stars of the heaven, how much more will he do it for the sons of men? and how infinitely more for his own children. So Isaiah applies, do you notice? He applies the truth in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? 
And then he goes on to tell them how the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He not only does not lack strength, he supplies it to the weakest of his children. Now there are therefore two principal things which should be produced in the lives of God's people as a result of a new revelation of God's greatness. The first is genuine biblical humility. And the second is genuine biblical hope. Before him all the nations are as nothing. He brings to naught the rulers and princes of this world. Genuine biblical humility, you see, is not something that we try to affect. It's not a diffident personality. It's not something indeed of which we are conscious at all, I would think. It is simply a fruit of the knowledge of God. Because nothing brings us to our true place before the eternal God but a new vision of his greatness. When man be begins to inflate and exalt himself in his stupidity, when he begins to imagine that he is possessed of some greatness, the thing that he desperately needs is an eye-opener to see something of the majesty and glory and greatness of God. But not only will it produce genuine biblical humility, it will also produce genuine biblical hope. Why do you say, O Jacob, verse 27, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? And here is the picture of a people beginning to lose hope, to have a sense of despair, to be overwhelmed by the greatness of circumstances and the greatness of their enemies and the greatness of man and not by the greatness of God. Now, says Isaiah, do you not know? Have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Now, you will notice that greatness and strength and power does not depend on natural forces like youthfulness. For even the youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. There is no greater illustration of what I mean than in that great account in 2 Kings chapter 6 of Elisha. Do you know it? My favorite story in the Old Testament. The king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, had begun to be distressed and concerned because all the plans that he had made in his attacks on Israel began to be communicated back to the king of Israel. And whenever they went out against the people of Israel, they discovered that the king of Israel already knew where the ambush was going to be taking place, and they were frustrated. Now the king of Syria gathered his courtiers together and his generals, and he said, no, something's going sadly wrong in our plans. What's happening is that whenever I plan something in secret with you, my counselors, the king of Israel seems to discover what's happening. And 
We are defeated and frustrated. Go away and find out what's happening. So they went away. And they came back to him and they said, My Lord, what's happening is this. Somebody seems to be communicating to the little prophet down in Dothan called Elisha everything that my Lord the King plans in his bedchamber. And he said, Get the army and send them down to Dothan and annihilate him. So all the army of Syria, the horses and the chariots, set out that day, and they made their way to Dothan to destroy the little prophet. The fascinating picture, if you think of it, you know, if somebody had stopped them in the midst of their journey and said, where is this huge army going to? And for what great encounter are you prepared? They would say, we are going to destroy the little prophet of God down in Dothan. That's where we are going. Well, they arrived there. And when they came, they covered the entire area with the horses and chariots of Syria. And Elisha had one young servant, a young man probably in the school of the prophets with him. And the young servant went out and he looked as he heard the rumbling of the chariots of the enemy and he saw the mountainside filled with the horses and chariots and infantry of Ben-Hadad. And he called Elisha out. And Elisha looked at it and saw the young man trembling. And he said, Don't be afraid. More are they that be for us than they that be for them. Now I can just imagine the young man looking at the mountains and viewing the hosts of the enemy around him and then looking at Elisha and himself and listening to Elisha's voice, more are they that be for us than they that be for them. And I can imagine that young man saying to himself, that's the great problem with these old fellows, you know. <laughs> they really ought to have retired him a long time ago. Unrealistic, that's the problem. Not really facing the facts of the contemporary situation. But you see, my friends, it was the old prophet who was facing the facts. And he turns to God and says, Lord, open the young man's eyes. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes and he saw the mountain full of the horses and chariots of the Lord. And that day God gained a glorious victory. And the people of Syria found their army led blindfold into Samaria. What is it that John says in his epistle? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Of whom does the prophet speak? If you turn to John chapter 12 later tonight, you will discover that he speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ in all his infinite glory. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in in the world. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for such a hope and for such a Savior. Let us pray. We bow in your holy presence, almighty God, and we marvel at your greatness and majesty. Pray that the eyes of our understanding may be opened, that we may see something of the wonders of your person in these days. 
for the glory of your great name. Amen.